Well, when it comes to seizures, there are actually many ways that wearable devices um, function. One is to try to record a person's seizures. In other words, to give an idea of how often these might be happening. But there's really a lot more than a device can do. It can send signals back to a website or maybe your doctor to let them know that seizures have happened. Um, we can teach and ask devices to capture other pieces of information, whether it's about medications or maybe other treatments that a person might be going through. And of course, nowadays, we're all wearing in some way wearable devices, whether it's smartwatches or our cell phones, and we can track all kinds of things like sleep patterns and sleep habits. And some of these things really overlap with seizures. Sometimes that can be very important with how to best manage a person's epilepsy. You know, it's a great question. And for me, it's really literally the difference between wearable um, meaning not implanted, and one of these devices, which really requires surgery. And for the DBS, the RNS, or the VNS, we need to place these in a surgical procedure in a location in the body that allows us to um, really optimize or get these devices to work in the best way that we possibly can, in the way that they're designed um, to function. Whereas when it comes to a wearable device, we're thinking about things that now are Literally things we wear, things we can take off, put back on when needed. We can wear some of these devices around the clock if that's what's needed to capture information and then use this information to make really good, solid decisions about treatment. Do we need to adjust treatments? Um, are we doing a great job already? Um, that's the difference for me in terms of implantable versus wearable. My first thought was to sort of remind ourselves that there's a tremendous amount of research that's going on right now, looking into ways to best identify seizures as they're happening. Now, there are lots of ways to measure seizures. Um, one is to look for shaking, let's say of an arm or a leg, something that's very, very common during certain kinds of seizures. We can look at changes in basically skin sweat, which also occurs more in certain kinds of seizures. We can look for changes in heart rate. You can see where actually all of these things might be important and how we combine this information is in the best possible way really is what all of the research is designed to do, is to find a device that really could, using these different sources of information, allow us to measure seizures very accurately and very faithfully. Now, that was a long way to sort of start all of this, and I think the devices that are currently available mostly are in the form of really a watch or a watch-like device, similar to what I think most people are familiar with with their smartwatches or maybe like a Fitbit that you would wear on your wrist, something that would measure things like heart rate, um, shaking or arm movements, and then things like sweating, all of which can change during a seizure. I think those are the ones that are currently available, at least in, both in Europe and the United States. Are there other ones being developed? Absolutely, yes. And I think what we're going to see over the next probably two, five, and certainly 10 years are not only a lot more in the way of these devices, but I think ones that are much more sophisticated and actually much more accurate in measuring the different kinds of seizures a person might experience. There are actually quite a few that I can think of right away. Um, I think one would be for a person who maybe experiences seizures, but really doesn't have the ability to remember that they occurred. In other words, it's actually hard for them to keep track of the seizures that they're having. Another situation would be where a person lives alone, whether in an apartment, or maybe actually there are other people that live in the apartment or in the home that they live in, but they don't really share the same room. In other words, this person would spend a lot of time basically on their own, where having a record, having um, some type of measurement of seizures uh, would be a really strong positive, at least in terms of driving or um, helping decision-making or treatments. Um, some people experience most of their seizures when they're sleeping. And so wearing a device during sleep, that one that could monitor and record seizures could be very helpful. Now, there's another aspect to wearable devices that we often think about and consider, and that is the device could send information to uh, my care team, my doctor, my nurse, and anyone else who's involved 
in the treatment of seizures and could send that information, let's say once a week or once a month to basically alert them or inform them of the number of seizures and the kinds of seizures that are happening. Now, I'd like to come back to that in a little bit when we talk more about the effectiveness of these devices, because there are some nuances to this. But I think those would be the kinds of things that immediately come to mind uh, when considering how a wearable, de wearable device might really be helpful to a, a specific person. You know, this is one of the biggest concerns that doctors have as well. That is the rare possibility, usually associated with convulsions, so tonic clonic seizures, is this thing called SUDEP. And there's been a lot of research to try to understand SUDEP better. And until we really understand this more, um, much of the effort has been focused on ways that we can either detect or prevent these very serious consequences of seizures. And this is where wear wearable devices could really help. If we think about it, these devices are very good at picking up on tonic clonic seizures. Now, it's not 100%, but it's very high in the low, low to mid 90s, by the way, so like 91 to maybe 94%. So, if that's the case, we could see where not only can a device keep track of the seizure, but we can envision a time where maybe a device could also send an impulse, let's say, to 911 to alert them that a seizure actually is in progress. And in that way, to be able to get to a person very quickly and make sure that whatever medical treatment is needed could be given right away to prevent this very serious thing from happening. But to me, in order for that to be a very effective way of using a wearable device, I think we'd want to have accuracy that was higher than that. And the other thing is we want to make sure that the device is not sending what we call false positives. In other words, an alert that a seizure is happening when, in fact, a seizure is not occurring. And an example of this would be, all right, let's say I was on my treadmill at home exercising, and so my arm is shaking as I'm running on the treadmill, and I'm starting to get a little bit, as well, sweaty from running on the treadmill. The device could pick up on the shaking and the sweating and maybe the increase in my heart rate and make an assumption that a seizure was occurring when in fact it wasn't. And the last thing I want is EMS knocking on my apartment door when I'm in the middle of my exercise routine, wondering what's going on and am I actually in the middle of having a problem? So you can see where accuracy in both areas, more accurate in terms of seizure detection and more accurate in terms of eliminating these false positives is gonna be a critical factor to deal with for devices to really help us in this area. So I always think of a couple of things right away. The first and foremost is I want a device that's very, very accurate. And ideally, a device that could pick up on lots of different kinds of seizures, not just the tonic-clonic seizures, but if I had abson seizures or perhaps myoclonic seizures, I want to be able to pick up on those as well. Now, I admit, we don't really have a device that is yet anyway capable of identifying all of the different kinds of seizures a person might experience. The devices nowadays are really best at identifying tonic-clonic seizures or convulsions. So the first is accuracy, and there's a lot of reasons for this. I want it to capture information that I can talk with my doctor, um, discuss treatment options, and really try to figure out what's the best way to proceed. Um, I want to have information that's not confusing. So this idea, again, of false positives, where if the device is saying that potentially I'm having several seizures a day, when in fact I know I'm, I know I'm not, I don't want to confuse, confuse the picture either. So I want it to be accurate, both from the standpoint of seizure counting, but also to make sure that it's not giving me information that might be basically wrong or inaccurate. I think ease of use is a very big part of all of this. And by that, I mean not just the ability to take it off and put it back on with ease, but also to be able to recharge it very easily. I don't want a device that's very complex or one that I need to interact with um, and need to sort of tell it a lot of information, or maybe I have to hook it to a computer and then work on the computer for a while to really optimize the use of a device like this. I'd really rather have a device that was a little bit more on its own, something that I could just take off when I need to, put it back on when I need to, and have it just do its thing and record this information very accurate, very accurately and very consistently throughout that time. Um, I think the last part is 
And this is where we don't still yet know um, how to use this information best, but I think I want a device that's very versatile, one that potentially could record lots of different kinds of information and using all of those different um, pieces of information to really optimize my seizures the best way possible, whether that's seizures in sleep, seizures that might occur more uh, during certain parts of the day. You see what I mean? So I want a device that can do all of those things and maybe actually one that can even learn a little bit and really be customized to me so I can get the most out of it. Um, nowadays, we probably don't have a device that can actually quite do all of those things, but I can tell you the research is definitely going in that direction. And I think in, within the next few years, we're gonna be seeing devices that are fully customizable and something that will really give us much more accurate, consistent information. It's another really important part of all of this and one we didn't touch on, and that is how expensive is uh, a device? And there's really two components to it. First is buying the device itself. But for some of these devices, a person also has a monthly subscription where they upload data using their device. In other words, it's the initial investment, but potentially a month by month charge as well. So there are two parts of this to consider. Now in the United States, it's always very complicated because each insurance plan is different. Some of the plans do in fact cover these costs. Um, some cover only part of the costs, and I'm starting to say some insurance companies cover none of the costs. So one of the ways to figure this out, that is how much um, investment am I gonna have in a device like this, is to work with your insurance company, really talk with them and try to figure out, is this something that's possible or is it just so expensive? Maybe it's something that I really can't consider, at least not right now.